welcome to part three in our series, Healing Hurts, where we are talking about, as the name suggests, how to find healing during this time of Lent. And we talked about how in week one that the two, ter two terms I'm using interchangeably in this series is healing and salvation. And so often we talk about how Christ came to save us and Christ came to give salvation to all mankind, which is true. But the question is, how do you define salvation? If you only define salvation as something after death, then you're missing the majority, not I want to say the majority, you're missing a big piece of the definition because our God is not just the God of the dead, but he's the God of the living. And salvation has as much to do with today as it does with tomorrow and the next day and on into eternity. And that's what we're talking about right here in this series is how to find that healing. Okay, I told you anytime you want to understand salvation, just put the word healing. Christ came to heal us, how to live that healed life that he lived when he walked on this earth and he desires to give to all mankind. And why it's our topic for Lent is because Lent in particular is the time we're talking about healing where I know that the doctor is in the office and I know that the healer is working. And I know that the physician of our souls and our bodies and our spirits, he's doing his thing. And I know where this road of Lent ultimately leads to, at least to the cross, and then ultimately Easter Sunday, the tomb, the empty tomb. So I know God is doing his work of healing. The question is, we, whether we find it will be based on our willingness to prepare ourselves to receive that healing. I told you there's two analogies that we're going to look at kind of carry us through this series. One is soil and the other is a building. Let's start with soil. In order for a soil to bring forth fruit, okay, the sower has to plant a seed, but the soil has to first be prepared. So God is the planter and he's going to put in his seed. And I know during this time of Lent, week after week after week after week, he's planting seed, planting seed, planting seed. But our job is to make sure our soil is ready because what's the purpose of planting the, the greatest miracle grow seed on the planet? If you put it into a sidewalk, it's not going to do anything. If you put it into dead soil. So what we're doing in this series is we're trying to work on our soil, prepare our soil because we know the seed is coming. The other analogy is about a building and the foundation. Okay, we are trying to do is, in, is make sure that the foundation of our spiritual home is solid. I know Christ is going to visit the house. I know that. I have no doubt about it. That's what Lent is all about, is walking the road with Christ, and especially when we get to Holy Week. I know he's going to walk in. The question is, what's he going to find when he walks in? A house that's falling apart? A house with beautiful windows and nice drapes, but no foundation? That's why I hear what we're doing in this series, is we're doing the hard work, the soil, the foundation. And our theme verse is this. It's Jeremiah 29, 13. It says, and you will seek me and find me, Say this with me. When you search for me with all your heart, when you search, I hope you search for him with more of your heart than you said that with, okay? When you search for me with all your heart, that's the goal of this series is that we are going to search for him and we're going to seek him and we're going to be diligent. And we know that he's there, okay? Especially during Lent, we know that he's there. But we've talked about it, about how the way to find healing is to find the healer in every circumstance. We know he's there in our trials, in our tribulations, in our spiritual sicknesses, in our relational sicknesses. We know that he's there. And the path to healing begins by finding the healer in every circumstance. So let's go quick recap what you missed the first two weeks. The first week we talked about the importance at the beginning of this journey of setting a goal, of setting a goal. And the reason why we talked about setting a goal is because we're going to do a lot of stuff during Lent. We're going to fast. We're going to pray. We're going to give. All right, we're going to go through life groups. We're going to read stuff together. We're going to maybe like add stuff to our spiritual routine. We're going to do more stuff. Well, the goal gives purpose to everything that I do. So like fasting, just for the sake of fasting, okay, it's good. But when there's a goal to it, it pushes me. It motivates me. Of, I know why I'm fasting. I know why I'm going to get up early and pray. I know why I'm going to be a little more generous with my, with my giving this time. I know why I want to spend more time with the TV off versus with the TV on. There's a purpose to it. And what Christ spoke about in the first week is about how setting a goal is good to make sure you set the right goal. Because there's some goals that moth and rust can destroy and thieves can break in and steal. So make sure you don't choose one of those goals. is isn't something that's here today and gone tomorrow. Said another way, it's an inside goal, not an outside goal. So the goal shouldn't be something on the surface like I need to pray more. Pray more is good, but that should not be our goal. It shouldn't be I need to fast more. I need to read my Bible those are good things to do, but we're trying to go a little bit deeper 
And we're trying to make sure that our goal is something foundational on the inside, on top of which we'll build a life of prayer and Bible and fasting and giving, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I gave you some examples in the first week. To say a goal is a new job, okay, that's not a good goal. A better goal is a new outlook on my career. That's a good goal. That's one that's going to last, or a new outlook on, on money. To say, for example, I want to stop fighting with my spouse, okay, that's okay, but that just means that you can just kind of like get through it and just kind of grin and bear it. What's better is a goal would maybe to understand my spouse and maybe understand myself a little bit better, get to the root of it. Even something like, I want to stop this sin, okay? I know so many people who we, I used to do this all the time, is 55 days of Lent, I'm going to stop this sin for 55 days of Lent, but then as soon as day 56 comes, she'll right back to where you started. Like anyone can you know, hold their breath for a certain period of time. What I want to do is I want to go deeper. I want to get to the root of why this keeps coming back in my life. Each week, we're going to look at one foundational virtue. And last week, we looked at the first virtue that we're going to put in our soil, and that is the virtue of humility. And Father Timothy spoke about humility is the basis of all healing because humility isn't really a virtue as much as it is reality, okay? It's not going above and beyond to know that God is everything and that we are nothing. Any relationship between any two people has to be based on the proper roles. So me and my kids, to have a healthy relationship between me and my son, he's got to know I'm the dad and he's the kid. But if he thinks he's the dad and I'm the kid, we're never going to have a healthy relationship. When I'm at work, I need to know who the boss is and who, like, who reports to me and who I report to. And that doesn't mean we need to lord it over them, but we need to know who's, in, where is, who's on the org chart. You go to a restaurant. You need to know who's the customer and who's the waiter. But if the waiter thinks he's the customer, no matter how nice, like, it's not going to work. Well, it's the same thing when it comes to our relationship with God. Father Timothy told us last week, we always must remember that we are the patient. We are not the physician. We are the patient. We are not the master. We are not the creator. We're the servant. We're the creature. We're the one who is in need of him, not vice versa. So that was last week. Today, we're going to get to the second virtue, which is connected to humility, but takes it one step further. Today, we're going to talk about honesty. And before I talk about honesty, show of hands, who here likes to travel? Okay, that's pretty much everyone. Okay, how about the opposite? Who here hates to travel like I do? Anybody? Okay, a couple of people. Very good. I hate airplanes. I hate airplanes. I hate them. I will take a 10-hour car ride before I would take a one hour plane ride. And sometimes I'm not able to because of logistics, but that's where I would much rather sit in a car because I'm in a car, I'm in full control. No one tells me when to stop and, and, and go to the bathroom. I'll go to the bathroom when I want to go to the bathroom. No one tells me, sorry, sir, now you can't do this. And that, that's what I don't like about an airplane. My knees are too long for the seats. My back hurts, my neck, I sweaty, I get stomach. I always, no matter what plane, no matter, I always end up next to a person on the airplane who thinks I am just the most fascinating person on the planet and we need to converse, converse the, whole app, the whole time. And I don't get it. I don't think I'm that charming, but somehow on an airplane, everyone wants to talk to me the whole time, never let me rest. And you know what's even worse than airplanes that I hate? Airports. Because airports, I'm telling you, some people want to know what it's like to be a priest and what it's like to walk around like this. You want to know what it's like. If you've ever wanted to be the center of attention and have all eyes focused on you, then join me for one beautiful Friday evening at McGee, uh, what is it called? McGee Tyson Airport in Knoxville, Tennessee. Okay, you can join me in that airport and I tell you be the center of attention because apparently that must be the only place on the planet that it is not only legal, but it is encouraged to stare at a person no matter how long and if they make eye contact with you. It's totally encouraged right there when you dress like this in an airport. I remember there was one time where I was traveling to Canada and crossing the border. And you know, when you cross the border, there's a little bit more, you know, that you go through and you go through the customs and then the, the different things. Anyway, so I'm going through the security, okay? And I randomly, okay, it's always a random search. It's always, okay? Because I got nothing in my pockets and nothing and nothing, nothing beeps, but it's always, excuse me, sir, random. And that's okay, I'm fine. I get to the airport early, like I get it. Pockets empty, like I, I get it. So I go and I'm randomly selected and I, they do the search thing. So they come and they pat me down and there's nothing. Then they ask me questions and nothing and look through, you know, my bag and nothing. But clearly there was something. So then, you know, they was, and then they call another guy to come over. 
Now we start the same thing all over from the beginning. Excuse me, sir, if you mind if I pat you down? So I'm like, sure, you can pat me down. And always, by the way, when they pat down a priest, they always think it's weird because like the robes, they're like, excuse me, I'm like, you do what you got to do, man. I'm just going to stand right here like this, okay? Help yourself, okay? So they pat me down again, and then they go through and ask me a million questions, and they look through my bag, and then they say, come over here. And you know when you go to the side room, okay, you know you're going to be in there for a while. Long story short, there was something in my bag that was concerning them. There was some kind of powder or lotion or something, and they're like, do you have it? And I'm like, I don't have anything. And I think this was just maybe a year or so after the anthrax thing. Remember the anthrax thing if you're really old? Okay, remember that? So they were, there was something in my bag that was concerning them. They took everything out of my bag. They couldn't find anything. Finally, they got it down, narrowed down to, it was my cell phone. Okay, and to show you how old this was, whoever had it, remember those trio phones? I had a trio, anyone had a trio, okay? Those things were, okay, those things were great. And they said something in this phone, and I'm like, it's just a phone, man. And half the time it doesn't even work, but you well, can do what you want with it. They wanted to take off the thing, take out the battery. And again, they just, what they came to the conclusion of, there was some lotion or something that got inside there. They wiped it. They checked it out. Everything was fine. And about 20 to 30 minutes, they let me go on my way. But here's my question for you. I know it's a silly question, but just humor me. Why did they go through all that hassle? Why all the hassle? Why the 20 minutes wasted? Why the first guy and then the second guy? Why the uncomfortable patting down? Like, why? Why all that? Humor me. Why? Okay, better safe than sorry. Okay, go a little bit further. What were they looking for? What were they trying to make sure of? What? Again, I know it's so obvious, but just help me out here. Better safe than sorry in what? They wanted to make sure that there was nothing hidden that could cause harm or danger. Make sense? On the outside, I'm fine. Again, I'm a pretty charming person, I think, when I have to be in those situations. So on the outside, everything was fine. And you'd be like, no, you're fine. But no, we need to go an extra step. Why? Because there could be something on the inside that we don't see. No, take my word for it, there's nothing. No, thank you, sir. We'd love to take your word, but we're going to check. And we're going to check. And when we don't find anything, you know what we're going to do? We're going to check a second time. And we don't find anything a second time, we're going to put it through the machine again. And then we're going to check. And then we're going to put you in this room. Because you know what? With all due respect, as much of a pain as it is, and as much hassle as it is, if there's something on the inside that's dangerous, we need to expose it right now. It's the same reason why when you go to a courthouse, you got to go through a metal detector. Because if there's something dangerous that's hidden, can't let it in here. Same reason why they check your bags when you go to the sports arena. If there's something dangerous, it's the same reason why when you came to church, they checked your temperature. Okay? Because if there's something hidden inside you that is not... A, it, it not seen by the naked eye, but it's inside, and it could cause harm to you. It could cause harm to others. It could cause harm to this whole place. You know what? Even if it's just a small little virus, we need to make sure that we expose it even though it is hidden and takes a lot of effort. Well, today, I invite you to walk through God's metal detector, God's security thing that beeps with the stuff inside. Here's our, our, our verse for today that we're going to look at. Let's read this together because this is really more of a prayer. This is not God telling us. This is us telling God. Let's read this together. It says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. This is our prayer for today. And this is what I'm going to challenge you to do today. This is the virtue of honesty is we are going to say to God, God, search me inside and out, backwards and forwards, up and down, left and right. I know I could just go by quick and say, no, 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 trust me, there's nothing inside. But no, if there's something inside here that's going to cause me harm or cause others harm, I want it exposed. So God, search me and reveal to me that there's something here, something there that may not be seen by the naked eye. We're talking about healing. When you go to a doctor and you say, doc, I'm hurting, I need healing. Oftentimes, first thing he says is, okay, go take an x-ray. I need to see what's on the inside. Okay, x-ray revealed nothing. What does he say? Go get an MRI because I really need to see what's on the inside and I can't see it from the outside. That doesn't work. You know, the, the CAT scan or the PET scan or the, 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 the U scan or whatever it may be. Okay, they want to know the blood test and show me what's in here and show me what's in there. They want to know what's on the inside because the first step of healing is discovering what's truly on the inside. Well, the same thing here. We want healing in our relationships. We want healing in our, in our spirits want healing in our thoughts. And the first thing is going to be to expose what is hidden inside there. In other words, what's really going on inside? Not the stuff that I say. 
But what's truly in there? The mess that's in there. How I got myself into this situation. Again, not the stuff that we tell ourselves to make ourselves feel good, but truly, this is not about, when I say honesty, I'm not talking about telling the truth. I'm talking about living the truth. Or said another way, what I'm going to challenge you to do today is I must be honest. I must be honest about my true spiritual condition, who I am truly, what's truly on the inside, not what, what I want to portray or present, not what I want to blame others or justify what's truly on the inside of me. Now, on the surface, you say, well, that's easy. I am honest. I don't lie. I mean, I tell the truth, and I know exactly what's on the inside of me. But I'll say, hold your horses there. Because did you know that our nature as human beings is not to tell the truth? Our nature is to hide from the truth when it doesn't make us look good. Our nature is to blame others when there's someone to be blamed. Our nature is to cover things up or turn a blind eye because as much as, this is the truth, okay? This is how we are. It's not just me, it's all of us. We don't like to feel bad. We don't like to feel bad about ourselves and we'll go to great lengths to do that. So what we'll say is, I'm not impatient. I'm not impatient. They're irresponsible. And if they weren't so irresponsible, I wouldn't be so impatient. But it's not the problem with me. I'm good. They're the problem. They're irresponsible. It's not that I'm selfish. It's not that I'm selfish, but this is what I deserve. Don't I work hard? Doesn't everyone else get, you know, go on a, a, a fancy vacation and to get to do stuff? So I don't need any of that stuff. But you know, when I come home, it's not I'm selfish or self-centered. No, no, no. I'm a good person. But this is what I deserve. Let's make it spiritual. It's not that I doubt God. No, no, I don't doubt God. But watch this one. I'm just making sure he knows what he's doing. I'm just helping him out. I'm just making sure. I'm just trying to be thorough. I don't that I don't doubt God. No, no, no. It's not me. I trust God fully. But I just, you know, want to make sure God, you know, Figures this thing out, right? So I'm just give him a hand. That's our nature. Our nature is turn a blind eye. Our nature is cover up. Our nature is hide. Our nature is, okay, not, not point fingers at anyone here, but this is the person who feels bad that he's gained weight. So what he does is just don't weigh yourself. Okay, this problem solved. And then you ask this person, how you doing? And he say, you know what? I'm about to 170, 175. And you're like, yeah, in 10th grade you were maybe, okay? But not since then you're not, okay? But the idea is covering it up makes us feel better, but we're smart enough to know we don't actually get better. And if our goal in this series, if our goal in this series is just to convince ourselves we're good, then yes, keep on lying to yourself. No problem. But if our goal is to actually be good, is to actually find healing, then we need to have some brutal honesty with ourselves. And again, just to show you that it's not you, go back to the very first man and woman ever created. Go back to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden when they made a boo-boo and they ate the thing that they shouldn't have eaten. And then God came uh, and all of a sudden, what did they do? How did they respond? By admitting their mistake? By being honest? Genesis chapter, oops, sorry. Genesis chapter three, verse seven. So then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed them fig leaves together and made themselves coverings they covered and they heard the sound of the lord god walking in the garden in the cool of the day and adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the lord god among the trees of the garden look this is we read this before we know this story and we say okay they hid from god because they were embarrassed this is hiding from the creator of the universe for me and you it's bad for adam and eve it's worse you know why because me and you, okay, and we don't know. And how do we know there's a God? I mean, you know, it's obvious there's God, but you know, we can pretend ourselves. We can convince ourselves. But Adam, Adam, you knew. Like you were the one person who knew. Because you see a whole bunch of stuff and you see everything around. And you're like, I know I didn't do it. And Eve, she just showed up a minute ago, okay? And she didn't come with any suitcases or anything like that, okay? So I know she didn't create this stuff. And I know I didn't create this stuff. So the only other option is God. So Adam, if there's one person who knew the story and knew that one person sees all, and knows all. Like, come on, Adam. Like, you know that you can't hide from God. But that's what he did. Because that's our nature. And ever since then, that's what we've been doing. Convincing ourselves that, you know what? No, 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 I'm fine. No, 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 I'm good. Again, back to the doctor analogy. No one wants in front of the doctor to expose themselves. But if you're not willing to expose yourself, you'll never find healing. Just plain and simple. If you are not willing to go through the uncomfortable, like, okay, uh, this is really, it's on the inside. You're never going to find healing. And I'm worried. If I'm honest, I'm worried that that's many of us spiritually. We're not finding healing. 
And we're walking around sick. And we're convincing ourselves that the world is against us or God is against us, whatever it may be. But what we are is people covering, covering, hiding, and say, I don't know why I'm not finding healing. I don't know why I don't didn't solve this. I don't know, well, how come God doesn't come in? Well, the answer is because of this. Our key thought for today is this. God won't heal what I won't admit. God won't heal what I won't admit. God won't heal what I won't admit. So let's be honest. Let's be honest. You don't pray. Let's be honest. You got excuses. In your mind, you're always like about to start a new prayer routine. I get it. In your mind, you're like, yeah, you were going to pray, but. But let's be honest. If you can't remember the last time that you spent more than 30 seconds, I'm not counting in the car, okay, when you're about to, the red light and you do like that, that does not what I'm saying, okay? When you pass a cop and you're like, that, please, that's not what I'm talking about. If you can't remember the last time you spent more than 30 to 60 seconds in focused prayer, then you know what? You don't pray, and I'm not judging you. I'm not telling you that that can't be solved. But what I'm telling you is admit the truth. It's not everyone else's fault. It's not just circumstances. Let's be honest. And when you do pray, let's be honest, let's go to the next step. Sometimes we just use prayer as a means to justify what it is that we're going to do anyway. So this happens. I see this all the time. I'm living in sin, and I'm doing this, and I'm doing this, but don't worry, I'm praying about it. The praying about it doesn't justify the disobedience. Something else. Some of us, if we're honest, we're mean. We are mean. And we'd say, no, no, no. Believe me, I met many people in my life. I never met one person who called himself mean. But the truth is, some of us are mean. Some of us talk about other people behind their back. And some of us ridicule them in a mean way. And we got to be honest. And some of us, if we're honest, and this is an ugly part that no one wants to call out, so everyone's just looking straight ahead here and saying, please don't look at me. Some of us, if we're honest, we're happy when certain people fail. We are. We get happy when they fail. We get annoyed when they succeed. Like, let's be honest. I'm not saying that it can't be sold, or I'm not judging. But I'm saying the first step to healing is expose. Here's another one. Some of us are gossips. I'm not saying some of us gossip. I'm saying some of us are gossips. And again, you would never call yourself that because you would, what you would say is, I hate people who gossip. I hate people who just gossip all the time. That's what you say. But the truth of the matter is, some of us, we have entire relationships that's built on gossip. When we get together with the guys or with the girls, that's what we do. All we do is talk about other people or talk about people who aren't in the room. That's called gossip, but we never call it that. What I'm saying is this. I'm saying is, until you admit God can't heal, because God can't heal what you won't admit. God can't heal what you don't admit. And the story goes, the list goes on and on. Some of us need to admit, you know what? I do got a problem. I am addicted. It has gone past normal level. Some of us need to admit, I have no self-control in life. I want to blame excuses and I want to blame someone else or make excuses or justify. I got no self-control. Some of us, I'll just go through the list. Some of us are bitter and we're unwilling to forgive. It's not everyone else's fault. Some of us don't trust God. Some of us are stubborn and we won't admit it because we're not, not that we're stubborn. It's that she's wrong or that he's incompetent. No, some of us are difficult human beings and we need to be honest because until we admit God can't heal. And again, just so we're clear, I'm not saying you are bad because you have a sickness or a sin. I got him. You got him. We all got him. Our doctor is a very good doctor. He is, he know he knows what he's doing. Sin is not the issue with him. Sin is solvable. Sin is solvable. Sin is solvable because he's a savior. The issue isn't the sin. The issue is the cover-up of the sin. The issue is the hiding of it. Once we go to the doctor and say, doctor, this is my problem. Doctor's like, sure, take two of these. Call me in the morning. No problem. God can heal. But our problem is we walk in, we're like, nope, we're good. Nothing. And he's like, are you sure? Nope, everything's good. Trust me. May want to keep an eye on what's her name, but that's okay. For me, I'm good. God won't heal what I won't admit. And that was the story of today's gospel. And today's gospel that we read earlier is the story of the prodigal son. And there's two parts to this story. It's a famous story. Everybody knows it. There's two parts to it. There's the first half and the second half. And the hinge upon which everything shifts is honesty. There's a, a ha first half of the story is pre-honesty. When the prodigal son was not honest with himself. And then there's the post-honesty and the two are night and day. Just look, we're going to look 
at, at, at the first half and then the second half. And I want you to compare the words used to describe the son's situation, pre-honesty and post-honesty, and you make the decision. Luke chapter 15, starting in verse 11. A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. Son comes up, and he says to his dad, I'm done. I can't take you anymore. And he had fully convinced himself, fully convinced himself, life will be better without my father. My father's mean. My father favors my brother. My father doesn't let me do anything. What I need is sweet, sweet freedom. And once I have sweet freedom, then my life will be great because this old man, he's cramping my style. He's ruining my life. I need to get rid of this man. He was fully convinced that the problem was 100% his father, 0% him. Next verse. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. Again, look at the words now to use pre-honesty, what his life was like. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And you look at those words, and you're like, what happened to sweet freedom? <laughs> what happened? Is it trouble in paradise, young son? Tr what happened to the great plan that you had thought up? And once I get out of here and bust out of this joint, my life is going to take off. Well, I, I might be missing it right here. Because what I see is feed swine. I see severe famine. And I see a son who's in want. And it gets even worse. Verse 16. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate. And no one gave him anything. We always look at this story and we think to ourselves, the son was eating the pig's food. How bad that is. The son was not eating the pig's food. It's much worse. He was envying the pig's food. He was like, man, I wish I could get there one day. One day I'll get to the pig's food. So he was not eating pig's food. He was envying pig's food. If you had to look at the son's existence, pre-honesty, this is a miserable existence. This is a perfect example of someone in dire need of salvation and healing. Would you agree with me? Let's look at the next verse. And I'm just going to show you the first Phrase in the next verse, verse 17, where everything shifts on a dime. It says, but when he came to himself, when he what? When he came to himself, what does came to himself mean? It means when he became brutally honest. When he was willing to examine himself and call it like it is. I was blaming my father, wasn't my father. I was so stubborn I thought everyone else was to blame except me and I'm fine and I'm good and everything's going to be great. And he came to himself and he realized, you know what? Maybe my dad wasn't so bad. Maybe the problem wasn't the father's house. Maybe it's me. It goes on. When he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough in despair and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father. Oh, sorry, I'll go back. I will rise and go to my father. And then from there, just kind of fast forwarding the story a little bit. You know what happens. He goes back to his father. Father greets him at the road, hugs him, kisses him, says, you know, doesn't even want to talk about anything in the past. Just wants to welcome him back into his home. And then here we see what, what, what his life looks like post-honesty. So we had the first one, the severe famine and the being want. Post-honesty, verse 22. Father says, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand, sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. Compare this to the life before, the famine, the want, the pigs. Now robe, ring, sandals, fatted calf, eat and be merry. All of that shifted on a dime. Pre-honesty, post-honesty. Verse 24. Father says, for this my son was dead and is alive again, was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. And what I'll say, I'll add on to that. He said, dead, alive, lost and found. I will say sick and healed. And what was the critical point? It was when he looked in a mirror and he stopped blaming everyone else. He had convinced himself it was everyone else to blame but him. He had convinced his friends. No, 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 I'm going to leave. And they're like, are you sure you should leave? They, he said, yeah, you don't know how bad my father is. You don't know what it's like in my house. It's, it's torture. It's abuse. Okay, if there was laws, I would, I would seek out. No, he convinced everyone around him that the problem was all there. And then finally, he looked in the mirror and said, you know what? Problems in there. And that was it. Like from the beginning, from the beginning, the power to heal was there. 
There was no need to go through the whole circus of run around and the famine and the pigs. There was no need for that. But actually there was a need because the son needed to be honest with himself about his true spiritual condition. Because as I said earlier, God won't heal what I won't admit. And it's time for us to do the same. It's time for us to be honest. If we're serious about healing, if we're serious about finding salvation that Christ is coming to give to us, it's time to be honest and be a man and call it like it is. Stop making excuses. Stop blaming others. If you got a problem with sin, if you got a problem with anger, call it like it is. I got an anger problem. I got a lust problem. I got a greed problem. I'm a selfish person. I am focused on myself and my own needs above the needs of anyone else around me. If you got a problem, call it like it is. If you are struggling in a relationship, you're struggling in marriage, okay, instead of just stewing about it and just kind of building up resentment and bitterness, call it like it is. Let's talk about it. And let's see what's really going on. And let's see where I am to blame. Because for sure, nothing is 100-0. Admitting a problem, this is an important point. Admitting a problem doesn't create the problem. What it creates is a path to healing the problem. Psalm 15, verse 1 and 2. It says, Lord, who may dwell in your sanctuary? Who may live on your holy hill? He whose walk is blameless and who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from his heart. When I say honesty, I'm not talking about honesty here. I'm talking about honesty here. That's the one who's going to find healing. Now, how does this work practically? There's a strange story. One of the strangest stories in the entire Bible that comes to us in the Old Testament in Genesis chapter 32. And it's a story, I know this is going to sound weird, of God wrestling Jacob. And I don't even know what that means, okay? Because I grew up watching WWF stuff, okay? So I understand wrestling, I understand turnbuckles, I understand leg drops, atomic elbows, off the top ropes. So that's, when I read God wrestling Jacob, like, I, I, don't, know, I, I don't know how to picture it, to be honest. But what we know is that at a certain point in time, Jacob, whose name literally meant deceiver, Okay, that was his name. He was a deceiver. Jacob was a professional con artist who had deceived people time after time after time, including his most famous con job was when he, get this one, stole a blessing. Okay, so it was a blessing from God, which he stole, which kind of seems like it would negate the blessing, but okay. He stole a blessing by tricking his blind father with the help of his sneaky mother. Talk about family fun. Like this family had some serious fun family nights, I'm sure. And when Jacob did this, Jacob had a million reasons. No, the old man never loved me. Like he had a million reasons and excuses. The old man always favored my brother. The old man had this coming. My brother had this coming to him because my brother, what he did to me in fourth grade, and he, I, knew I got to get him back. And he convinced himself that, you know what? I'm only doing what I deserve. I'm not a dishonest person. Like, I'm just doing what's right. Like, my dad's got it coming. My brother's got it coming. You know what? They named me liar. So this is what they get, okay? For giving your son the name liar or deceiver. So one day, God says, you know what, Jacob? Because I love you and I want to heal you. God corners him and he gives him no place to run. Genesis chapter 32, verse 24 and 25. Then Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him. We know this man is God because the capital M, okay? The capital M man. A man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. Now, when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And again, don't ask me what this looked like physically. I don't have the faintest idea. But what I do know is that God wanted to heal Jacob. And it took a struggle because I'm sure God came to Jacob and said, Jacob, Let's, let's fess up about this thing. And Jacob said, I don't know what you're talking about. Jacob, I need you to, hey, it's all his fault. And Jacob, and then finally, <laughs> he couldn't take it no more. So he had to wrestle him to the ground. And it looks like Jacob fought back, okay? And he was able to kick out of the pin or whatever it was. And God, not to be denied, eventually wrestled Jacob down and said to Jacob, no more running. Face the truth. Be honest. What is truly on the inside? But he says it in a slightly different way. He says in verse 27, so he, this is God, said to Jacob, what is your name? And Jacob responded with his name, Jacob. Now, you know, in the Old Testament, names had meaning. Okay, it wasn't just like 
uh, you know, they thought it was a cute name like we do today, like, you know, this uh, name that a superstar has. It had meaning. So when God says to him, what is your name? He was actually asking him, not what is your name, but who are you? Who are you on the inside? And Jacob, maybe for the first time in his life, for the first time in his life, he said, you know what? I'm a liar. I'm a deceiver. It's not the old man's fault. It's not Esau's fault. It's not the world's fault. It's not the government, social media, my wife, my kids, my boss. It's not. It's not that I was dealt a, a, a bad hand and life owes me or the universe owes me. None of that stuff is true. The truth of the matter is I'm a dishonest person. I lie for my own personal benefit. I'm a deceiver. And I've in my path, I have deceived and conned and tricked people all for my own personal benefit. And for the first time in his life, Jacob came clean. He stopped running. He admitted the truth. And as soon as he did, God says to him, verse 28, okay, that's good. Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. Boom, we're done. That's it. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. See how it works? We struggle. We, okay, I admit the truth. And God's like, okay, now we can solve it. Thank you so much. See how it works? The healer is going to do the healing. The sin is not the problem. He's a good doctor, okay? Trust him. He knows what he's doing. But we have to be willing to be honest because God won't heal what I won't admit. Question for you. And I wish I could look everyone in the eye right here. And I'll look in the camera on the eye. Everyone in the eye. If God wrestled you tonight when you got home, if God said, I'm not going to let you go till you admit your name, what would you say? Who are you really? What's really going on on the inside? Some of us would say, my name is worry. That's my name. That's who I am. Some of us, my name is greed. Some of us, my name is lust. Some of us, my name is anger, bitterness. Resentment. Like, what's your name? I told you in the beginning, this isn't, this isn't going to be easy. Finding healing isn't going to be easy. Tilling the soil is painful. Building the foundation requires a lot of work. But if you want the building to stand, if you want the soil to bring forth fruit, what you do in the beginning stages on the inside, which no one sees, that's the most important part. And for Jacob... Healing came on the heels of brutal honesty. And for the prodigal son, healing came on the heels of brutal, brutal honesty. And maybe the end of this Lent will add your name to that list too. That healing will come on the heels of brutal honesty. Because God can't heal what I don't admit. Now I'm going to leave you with two thoughts, okay, as far as, far as how this process is going to go. And we're going to get more into this for those who are signed up for life groups. We're going to talk more about this, okay, in our life group this week. I want to give you two thoughts to guide you as you uh, send you off here to be brutally honest with yourself. And here they are, real quick. Number one, no sickness is too big to heal. No sickness is too big to heal. And we will be tempted, just probably like Jacob, just definitely like the prodigal son, we will be tempted to say, this is too bad, this is too hard, no hope for me, I've tried this before. Prodigal son was the worst kid on the planet. Okay, so you always remember him if you say, what I did is too bad. No, no, look at the prodigal son. He was a bad son. He did a very bad thing. He basically said to his dad, I want you to be dead. I don't want you to be alive anymore. I'm sick of you. And he was welcome back. And that's just the beginning. Soon, we're going to go through this Lenten journey. And we're going to see the Samaritan woman. She was bad news, man. And then we're going to see the thief who was crucified on the right of Christ. Bad, bad news. I'm telling you, even Judas, okay, even Judas himself, had he been willing to admit and be honest, there was a path to healing for him. So there's no one who's worse than them. No one is worse than them. So don't ever say that I am too bad. This is too big to find healing. Something Father Timothy said last week, we discussed it in our life group. We had a nice discussion around it. You remember last week, Father Timothy said that we must remember humility is I am a, I am a child of God and I am a sinner. Okay, I am a sinner and a child of God. I'm a sinner and a child of God. And we were talking in our life group about how sometimes we think it's like, okay, I have to be balanced between those two. And I don't want to be on either extreme. And I said in our life group, I said, no. I actually think you should be on both extremes because one has nothing to do with the other. It's two sides of the same coin. It's not that I'm, I'm a sinner 
And if I'm a less sinner, I'll be more of a child of God. Or if I'm more a child of God, I'll be less sinner. No, no, absolutely not. Both are 100% true. At all times, I'm 100% sinner and I'm 100% child of God. And the more sinner I am, doesn't make me less child of God. And the more child of God I am, doesn't make me less sinner. I am a sinner. I'm a child of God. We don't need a balance of these two. We need to know that both are true at all times. So don't be scared to dig inside and say, no, I am a sinner. And I really am a sinner. And I really am a sinner. It doesn't make you less of a child of God. What I actually said in our life group, I actually said that me personally, the times I feel most child of God is the times I'm most convinced that I'm a sinner. The two are not balanced. The two are not working opposed to one another. The two are in perfect conjunction with one another. So don't make that mistake. No sickness is too big for God to heal. And then number two, maybe you need, this may be the one you need to focus on. No sickness is too small for us to ignore. Nothing too big to heal, nothing too small to ignore. Because if I got a big ship, a big, huge ship, a titanic size ship, all I need to do to sink that ship is a little hole in the bottom. If I have a nice garden, okay, a big garden, all I need to do is put a little bit of weeds in there and eventually it'll spread. Big house, little termite. Big, strong, Hulk Hogan, strong man. A little coronavirus put inside him, take him down. It's not necessarily the size. Instead of size, instead of looking at it as big versus little, like that's how we think, big sins, little sins. I'm going to give you maybe a new framework to think through. Don't think of it as big sins, little sins. Think of it as hidden sins and visible sins. Because it's not the size of the sin. It's whether or not I see it and I know it and I can spot it. And I'm telling you, a big sin that you see is better than a small sin that you can't see, and that's hidden. Songs chapter 2, verse 15. It says, catch us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines. The hidden sin is worse than the seen sin. Just like if I have an enemy, and there's bad guys, and I know there's bad guys in the street, that's bad, but you know what's worse? Bad guys in my closet, or bad guys hiding, hiding under the bed. The bad guy in the street, there's so many of them but I see them coming. But the bad guys underneath the bed, now I'm in real trouble, okay? Because I'm sleeping there at night and I'm very vulnerable. <clears throat> don't wait for little to become big. Don't, I'm sorry, don't wait, yeah, for the little things that are inside to grow into big, huge things. Don't wait, once you know that there's a weed in your garden, okay, you take it out. Once you look inside and you find something that's there, like how many of us wish we could go back in life how many wish we could go back and when there was a small sin, a little sin, but we didn't notice it or we just kind of looked past it. How many of us wish we could go back right now and go pluck it out and throw it away and be done with it forever, but it's too late. The smartest, healthiest people are the people who examine themselves regularly and see what's on the inside and attack sins at the seed level versus the tree level. Because while I cannot pull that big tree out of my yard, I can absolutely pull out that seed, okay, that little weed when it's small. Last verse I want to leave you with is from 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 through 9, and it says this. It says, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See what this verse is saying right here is nothing too big, nothing too small. Let's start with nothing too big. If we confess, no problem. If we confess our sins, he'll take care of it. He'll wash it. He's done with it. But if we hide our sins, even the small ones, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. My hope for today is that we can all take a step in terms of honesty by looking deep inside. Realize that when we lie to ourselves and we hide the sin, realize we're not fooling anyone except ourselves because the people around us know, okay? And if you don't believe that the people around you know that you got an anger problem or you got an impatience problem or you got a self-control problem or you got a greed problem, go ask them. And if you're married, guarantee you they'll tell you the truth. Okay, that's a, that, that, that's a foolproof way. The people who live with you and see you on a day-to-day -day basis, they're not fooled. The people who work with you, they're not fooled. The only person you're fooling is yourself. Running from the truth doesn't make it any less true. Just in the same way that doing this doesn't make it any less light in this room 
It only means that I can't see it. So my hope and my prayer is that this week, we're going to go through God's metal detector, God's inside detector, okay? And we're going to say to him, like I said in Psalm 139, oh God, search me and know me and see what inside me is causing problems. And we're going to ask God to do some deep digging. And that might require, like Jacob, a little bit of wrestling, a little bit of discomfort, because no one wants to expose what's on the inside. But I promise you, that is the first step towards healing. And that's where we're going to pick things up next week. Next week, we're going to talk about the grace of God and how God's grace works. But I'm telling you, before we talk about grace, grace is the work of God in our life. Before we're ready to talk about grace, we have to make sure that we've plucked out the weeds. We got to make sure next week we're going to start to get some planting. Okay, God's going to start to work inside. But before we get there, we need to make sure that we have exposed what's on the inside. Because as I said, God won't heal what I won't admit. Let's stand together for a prayer. <clears throat> In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your never-ending compassion and love and mercy and knowing that there's truly nothing too big for you to wash and to heal. Lord, I pray that you would help us to go deep inside and to expose the things that are in there that are causing all the problems. Give us to be honest with ourselves and honest with you and not blaming everyone else or justifying our, our, our sins, but truly going deep inside because we know, Lord, that your power to heal is here and is ready to work in a powerful way during this time of Lent. We ask this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, with the prayers and intercessions of all your saints, hear us as we pray. Thankfully, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen.